Distinguished guests and colleagues, good morning. I'm Liang Yingxiu from Beijing Normal University. Welcome to the open forum on rule of law for data governance, hosted by the Bureau of Internet Laws and the Regulations of Cyberspace Administration of China. With the deepening of globalization and digitalization, data has become one of the core drivers of economic innovation and social development. Data application and governance face both opportunities and uh, challenges. At the same time, fair and effective data governance is essential for public benefits and sustainable development. This forum aims to gather different uh, stakeholders from government, civil society, and the technology community, as well as private sector in Asia, Africa, Europe, and America to exchange insights and ideas on the current status and ev evolution trend of global data-related applications and data governance to examine and assess important concerns and uh, challenges in global data governance and uh, to explore the rule of law approach for data governance that is beneficial to the common values of humanity. Now let's start the forum with the first session of keynote speech. Please remind you that each speaker can have eight minutes. First of all, let's welcome Mr. Tang Lei, Deputy Director General of Bureau of Internet Laws and Regulations of Cyberspace Administration of China. Please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today, we are gathering here in the Internet Governance Forum to exchange our thoughts on the future of digital governance for humankind. I find it very meaningful and look forward to a constructive outcome of the forum. Since China was fully connected to the Internet in 1994, it has committed itself to law-based cyberspace governance, enhancing continuously the level of law-based cyberspace governance. China is the world's largest developing country and has the largest number of internet users. We always uphold people-centered development and we always uphold further development of the internet. With a keen understanding of the extreme difficulties and complications in cyberspace governance. China has been forward looking in responding to the ch ch challenges brought by new internet technologies, applications, and business forms and models, and promoted innovation in the concept, content, approach, and methods of law-based cyberspace governance. Meanwhile, China has played an active part in international exchanges and cooperation in law-based cyberspace governance. It's committed to build a multilateral, democratic, and transparent global internet governance system together with other countries. Distinguished, distinguished guests, friends, China set out from its realities to explore its approach to cyberspace regulation and governance. Consolidating the legal system for cyberspace governance. Until March 2023, China has enacted more than 140 laws on cyberspace, forming a cyber legislation framework endorsed by traditional leg legislation and underpinned by specialized cyber laws governing online content and management, cybersecurity, information technology, and other elements. Keeping order in a rule-based cyberspace, China has taken rigorous measures to ensure fair and rule-based law enforcement in cyberspace strengthening enforcement in key areas of immediate concern to the people, 
promoting a healthy cyber environment, promoting public awareness and competence in law-based cyberspace governance. China makes every effort to break new ground in the content, form, and means of spreading legal knowledge via the internet. The Chinese netizens' awareness and understanding of the rule of law have generally increased. Respecting, learning, abiding by, and using the law is a shared understanding and basic principle. Increasing international exchanges and cooperation in law-based cyberspace governance. China is fully engaged in international exchanges and cooperation in the field of law-based governance of cyberspace. It plays an active role in rulemaking, and it resolutely safeguards the international system with the United Nations at its core, supports the participation of all countries in global cyberspace governance on an equal footing, engages in bilateral and multilateral dialogue, dialogues and exchanges in law-based cyberspace governance, increase international law enforcement and judicial cooperation on cybersecurity, distinguished guests, friends. The internet benefits the whole world. China champions the interests of the people of all countries in promoting law-based cyberspace governance. We stand ready to partner with colleagues from all over the world to enhance the level of law-based cyberspace governance. China will further improve legislation on digital governance and endeavor to establish a legal system for the protection of people's rights and interests in cyberspace, data security, and platform regulation. Deepen the implementation of laws and regulations in the digital field. China will also put the role of the United Nations as a main channel into foreplay and has strengthened international exchanges and cooperation in making rules for digital governance through platforms like the BRICS Cooperation Mechanism, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the World Internet Conference. Distinguished guests, friends, facing the opportunities and challenges brought by digitalization, China will follow the global governance principle of achieving shared growth through consolution and collaboration and work together with the international community to ensure global digital governance is law-based and that digital progress will deliver greater benefit to the people and a better world. In the end, I'd like to conclude by wishing today's open forum a great success. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Tang, for the relevant experience of China. Now I give the floor to the Neil Walsh, head of UNODC Mission and Regional Representative for East Africa. Good morning, everybody. Can I check that you can hear me OK? Yes, you can. Thank you. OK, a very good morning to you all from Vienna in Austria, where it's approaching three o'clock in the morning and I'm in a very small hotel room. Uh, so it is a great pleasure to be with you all. My name is Neil Walsh, and it's my honor to be the head of mission and regional representative of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime in Eastern Africa, where I'm normally based in Kenya. My 200 staff and I cover 13 countries in East Africa and the Indian Ocean, and we deliver UNODC's effects to counter organized crime, terrorism, and corruption. I wish to express at the outset my deep thanks to the Internet Governance Forum, the Bureau of Internet Laws and Regulations of the Cyberspace Administration of China, 
and to my dear friend and mentor, Professor Wu Shenkuo of Beijing Normal University, who I saw on camera a few moments ago. I only wish that I could be with you all in Kyoto, but unfortunately, the dates clashed with UNODC's annual Heads of Mission meeting, and I have to be here in Vienna. The topic of today's event is the rule of law for data governance and subjects that both the CIC and BNU are world experts in. But these are topics of criticality, not just for the institutions I've named, not just for the People's Republic of China and the IGF, but for every nation, every business, and every person on our planet. And in Eastern Africa, I see on a daily basis the absolute need for all of these aspects to come together. Data governance is a broad term, and I suspect that all of us could explain it and define it in different ways based upon our experience, our education, and our culture. And as we all know, definitions in all things cyber are often very politically challenging and academically diverse. But friends, I think we can all agree that we have a broad collective understanding of the importance of data governance in personal, national and international security. Data, be it personally identifiable or more anonymized, drives our world, whether we're conscious of it or not. Data also drives our thought processes, our desires and our biology. Whether it's the serotonin boost from a social media like, or our revulsion when we see, experience, or think about organized crime, data is at the core of everything that we do. And thinking about the adverts that we see every day, the data mining that drives the targeted advertising, and the surprise that we all feel, followed by a slightly uncomfortable sense when we realize that the new product we've been discussing with friends is suddenly across all of our social media feeds without asking or without searching consciously for it can be quite unpleasant. Data is the product of choice for exploitation and profit. And the region of the globe that I lead for UNODC, there is a daily clash between the desire for more data and our ability or not to analyze and exploit it at pace. The legislation and governance mechanisms of the raw and segmented data, whether within one's own country of residence or nationality, or beyond that, is often unclear. And from my experience, conversations and guidance from Professor Wu and the CAC over the years, it's clear to me that there is much more always to be done. And so data is at the heart of the United Nations. It must be at the core of our decision making on topics as diverse as economic growth, sustainable development, and countering cybercrime. And I was able to listen to the last 15 minutes of the previous session and to see some old friends like uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Alison Peters on stage, where we are discussing these matters together. Data, when mined proportionately, lawfully, accountably, and necessarily, can make the difference between an emotional response and an objective decision. And in my role leading the UN's work in Eastern Africa, I've placed the need for routine, accurate, strategic intelligence data at the core of our business. We can't give good country level and regional policy advice if we don't have good data. And good data sourcing without the ability to assess, analyze and exploit it is at best wasted or at worst dangerous. And some years ago, I led the UN's policy response to cybercrime, and my colleague Nayeli Loya led our operational programming globally. And I can remember so many meetings and conversations when we met ministers around the world who saw cybercrime as a future threat. None of us consider cybercrime to be a future threat now. It is the here and now, everywhere. And just recently, a country in my region in Eastern Africa suffered a devastating cyber attack. It only lasted for a few hours, but the impact was significant. Electricity failed in some regions. Payment systems in shops failed. The economy stalled. This was, without doubt, a national security incident and an international security incident. And so we need good law. 
we need good policy nationally and internationally to create the means to assess the threat and to prosecute offenders and to hold to account those who seek to undermine development and cause harm. And we need it now. I'm deeply encouraged by the work being done by UN member states under UNODC's stewardship to craft the new cybercrime convention and the interventions of non-governmental organizations and civil society and academia are absolutely critical in this debate as well. This is diplomatically hard and many countries have divergent views. But most worryingly for me is the lack of involvement of countries in my region in Eastern Africa. The convention work is as important for Africa as it is for Asia, Europe and the Americas. So it is incumbent for all of us to create a supportive, nurturing, challenging environment for those who should engage and get the best out of this debate, but are currently absent. We need to use our collective skills to bring them and their insights, their experience and guidance to support and mentor those who are yet to step into these areas in necessary depth. Because we all know that if we don't fill this space, others will. Others who don't have our good, peaceful intent at heart. Others who will seek to harm and to exploit. And that's why it's so important to talk together about the rule of law for data governance. We need to talk to one another, and most importantly, friends, we need to actively listen to each other too. That's what the public, the people we serve, expect from us and need from us. This is preventive diplomacy in action. And that is why today's event right now is so important. So friends, I want to thank you once again to the IGF, to the Cyberspace Administration of China and Beijing Normal University for inviting me to speak with you. I really wish I could be sitting with you right now. But most importantly, I want to say an enormous thanks to all of you who care about the topic, its seriousness and the consequences if we get it wrong. So from the middle of the night in Vienna, thank you for listening and I hand it back to you in Kyoto. City. Thank you, Mr. Walsh for your wonderful sharing. Now let's turn to Professor Wang Yi, Vice President of Renmin University of China for his speech. Professor Wang. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Mr. Speaker, my fellow panelists and our distinguished audience, it is quite an honor to have this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on state governments today. I would like to provide a brief overview from the dual perspective of a participant in the legislative drafting process and a legal scholar in civil law in China. I will introduce some of the consensus reached by the academic community on date governance and the latest progress in this field. They are divided into the following two sections, personal information protection and corporate data governance. In terms of personal information protection in China, the civil code of the People's Republic of China has taken the lead in providing rules and standards for personal information protection in both its general provisions and the right to personality section. Since information technology has posed new challenges to the protection of personal information, after the enactment of the civil code, the personal information protection law of the People's Republic of China has overall continued the provisions of the civil code's relevant articles but with more specific use within the existing framework. China's legislative model of dual protection for personal information through the civil code and the personal information protection law exhibits several unique characteristics. Firstly, the civil code distinguish between the right to privacy and that to personal information protection. 
making the boundaries between the two clearly. Traditional privacy rights primarily address one-to-one -one infringement, while personal information protection primarily deals with large-scale, micro-level infringements. Secondly, the civil code provides a balance between the protection and the utilization of personal information. The personal information protection framework initially originated from the handling of personal information by government agencies. However, today, technology companies, especially online platforms, have become the primary actors in information processing. Therefore, personal information protection should be subject to adjustments within civil legal system. Moreover, China's civil code also places emphasis on safeguarding personality rights. It complements the personal information protection law together forming a legal framework with Chinese characteristic in legal practice. The second topic I'd like to discuss is the civil code and the corporate data governance in China. In today's world, where the value of a big data is widely recognized, how should we approach the legal framework of this big data? Should big data be exclusively discussed in the context of intellectual property? An emergent and important consensus in China is that there are many types of interests that can be associated with data, not limited to the personal and the property interests typically associated with intellectual property. Based on this consideration, the civil code has included multiple provisions for data within civil law. As the object of legal relationships, the Chinese academic community shares the following three points of consensus of the key and the most important differences between data and others, such as tangible and real property. The first and foremost is that data is non-exhaustible and able to be repeatedly utilized. The second characteristic is that when it comes to collection and utilization, data can be collected and used in parallel among multiple actors. The third characteristic is the complexity of the types of interests that data can carry. It can potentially carry both personal and property interests. Building on such shared notions, the biggest dispute in academia and the practice is how the law allocates property interests above it. A typical example is the disputes caused by web crawlers. In China, there are mainly two divergent viewpoints. One is to establish property rights over date and resolve disputes through property rights. The other is to access and resolve disputes through the legality of the relevant behaviors. However, given its two models differ, they still lead to similar outcomes. Even when data is subject to general property rights, such rights are often restricted and access is granted to other parties, especially ordinary users. Similarly, establishing legal rules for relevant actions also requires defining the boundaries of rights for different entities. In my personal opinion, it is inevitable to establish property rights over the monetary interests carried by data, but the content of data rights that corporations enjoy may vary in different contexts. As far as I am concerned, governments around the world share similar concerns. I believe that 
China's data governance practice will provide valuable reference for other jurisdictions. This is all I have for today's forum. Thank you very much. Thanks for Professor Wang's sharing, which provided us with a new perspective. Next speaker, let's invite Mr. Xu Zhiyuan, Deputy Chief Engineer from China Academy of Information and Communications Technology. Please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, China's framework of transporter data flow management. At present, as data has become a key strategic resource, major countries and regions in the world had uh, implemented uh, different degrees of restri restrictions on the cross-border data flow and have constructed their own cross-border data flow management system. However, the international community has not yet formed a general consensus on the specific uh, regulatory rules of cross-border data flow. And there are mainly three models, uh, the United States, the European Union, and the emerging countries. China has uh, always promoted cross-border data flow in accordance with the law and has uh, basically established a uh, framework based on the rule of law. Since 2016, China has established the 3 plus 3 legal system with the uh, cyber secur security law, data security law, and the personal information protection law as a top level design. And the data export security assessment measures uh, personal information export standards contract measures and detailed rules for the implementation of personal information protection certification as uh, supporting uh, rules. In accordance with the three plus three legal system, China has promoted the supervision and control of cross-border data flow in an orderly manner. In particularly, a uh, number of demonstration cases have been formed in the security assessment of outbound data. At the same time, China's local level has actively explored the innovation pilot of data outbound, promoting the safe and uh, orderly cross-border data flow, and stimulated the value of data elements. Next, I would like to introduce three ways of Chinese data export. First is safety assessment. The 3 plus 3 legal system establishes the basic requirement that the data export of import data or a certain amount of personal information must pass a security assessment. Second is the standard contract. Uh, which is formulated mm, by the uh, Cyberspace Administration of China and signed by the, uh, by the personal information processor and the overseas recipient, stimulating the rights and obligations of both parties. Third is protection certification. Uh, protection certification is an activity uh, in which a professional institution approved by CAC conducts a comprehensive evaluation of the inf personal information protection and management measures of uh, personal information processors in accordance with CIC regulations. If the measures meet the requirements, the institution will issue a certification mark to the processor. On the basis of the 3 plus 3 legal system, China has further explored and uh, innovated to promote the orderly uh, cross-border data flow. Recently, the State Council of China issues a special document on foreign investment 
the title is uh, Opinions on Further Optimizing the Environment for Foreign Investment and Increasing the Efforts to uh, Attract Foreign Investment. The document proposed to explore a convenient security management mechanism for cross-border data flow. We will implement the requirements of the cybersecurity law, the data security law, and the personal information protection law, establish a green channel for qualified foreign invest enterprise, effectively carry out outbound security assessment of important data and personal information, and promote the safe, orderly, and free flow of data. On September 28th, uh, the CIC drafted special regulations on the cross-border data flow to solicit public opinions aiming to further promote the orderly and the free flow of data in accordance with the law. Uh, distinguished guests, China has always opened its door to the development of the digital economy and actively engaged in international co cooperation. In the face of the development of the global digital economy, China will continue to regulate the cross-border data flow in accordance with the law, adhere to the vision of building a community with a shared future for mankind, and share the dividends of digital development with the other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Xu. Now let's welcome Professor Jesus Law co-chair of the International Steering Committee of UNESCO, Media and Information Literacy Alliance, and the Vice President of University of Veracruz, Zena. Hello, good evening here. I'm in the southern part of Mexico. And I would like to say thanks to Professor Wu of Virginia Normal University and to CAC for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel. My paper is called Naked Address, Law for Data, Challenges and Opportunities in Mexico. Citizens in Mexico and in Latin America in general have legal and de facto options to be data naked or dressed in our contemporary data-driven modern society. In other words, they have the right to allow, to allow or restrict the compilation and tracking of the digital footsteps in cyberspace. Mexico has a sound legal framework to protect individuals' privacy. Data protection is ensured in Article 6 and 16 of the Mexican Constitution, as well as in the federal law for the protection of personal data held in private parties published in July 2010 in its regulations published in December 2011. The Mexican rule of law for data governance ref refers to a set of principles and practices that ensure that data within an organization or society is managed and governed in a fair, transparent, and consistent manner in accordance with established laws, regulations, and ethical standards. The authority responsible for data protection is the National Institute of Transparency, Access to Information and Personal Data Protection, uh, the acronym or the abbreviation is INAI. INAI oversees compliance with the law and has a primary focus on disclosing governmental activities, budgets, and pub public information, as well as protecting personal data and individuals' right to privacy. INAI has the authority to conduct investigations, review and sanction data protection controllers, and authorize, oversee, and revoke certifying entities. The Ministry of Economy is responsible for informing and educating national and international corporations with commercial activities in the Mexican territory about their obligations regarding the protection of personal data. Among other responsibilities, it must issue relevant guidelines for the content and scope of the privacy notice in cooperation with INAI. However, there are many challenges in Mexico, 
such as data breaches, hackers targeting private and government data repositories pose a significant threat. Number two, legislative lag. Data protection legislation often lags behind technological advancement and emerging threats. Number three, government ethics, ensuring ethical data handling and decision making within the government is essential. Social media tracking. Social media platforms are major data trackers for marketing purposes, and sometimes this can be annoying. Number five, limited data literacy. Many citizens lack the necessary skills to understand, interpret, and effectively use data. The last challenge, in other words, limited data literacy, in the bold list is certainly the most important because it can help address the rest of the challenges. Mexico needs to foster data literacy among its citizens, empowering them to understand, interpret, and effectively use data in today's artificial intelligence-driven world. To address these challenges, the country should, number one, raise awareness, promote the importance of data literacy and its benefits for personal and professional development. Number two, simplify complex data, develop strategies and tools to make complex data more accessible and understandable. Number three, manage data overload, provide guidance on how to navigate and extract meaningful insights from large data sets. Number four, overcome technological barriers, ensure to technology and offer training on data analysis tools. Number five, address data quality, promote data quality practices and techniques for cleaning and reprocessing data. Number six, teach statistical and mathematical concepts, offer education on statistical and mathematical concepts relevant to data analysis. Number seven, emphasize data privacy, educate individuals and organizations on responsible data handling and privacy compliance. Number eight, expand data access, enhance availability and access for all citizens. Number eight, promote change, encourage organizations to adopt data-driven decision-making and foster a culture that values data. Number 10, address cultural and organizational barriers, provide support, resources, and a conductive, conducive algorithmic culture for data literacy. Number 11, and last, allocate time and resources, invest in training and development of data literacy skills, considering time and budget constraints. Conclusion, prioritizing data and information literacy education and training at both individual and organizational levels is essential. This may involve offering courses on data and algorithm, algorithmic literacy, providing access to data analysis, tools, and resources. And fostering a culture that values data-driven decision-making. Additionally, continuous efforts to raise awareness about the importance of data literacy can motivate individuals to acquire these skills and make informed choices about the digital presence in cyber space. As a summary, according to the, the main message is that we need to offer data liter literacy training to our citizens. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak at this session. I wish you success in the following uh, sessions. Thank you, Professor Law, for your wonderful words. I give the floor to the next speaker. Ms. Zheng Junfang, CRO and CF CFO of Alibaba Cloud Intelligence Group, please. Thank you. Respected Mr. Tang Lei and other speakers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good morning. It is a great pleasure to participate in this workshop and exchange ideas with you all on this topic. Today, our lives and work are intertwined with digital technology 
like never before. Indeed, data as a factor of production has emerged as a strategic resources for economic development. Chinese President Xi Jinping stated, we need to build a digital economy with data as a key factor, boost the integrated development of the real and the digital economies, and further integrate the internet, big data, and artificial intelligence with the real economy. As one of the earliest internet companies in China, Alibaba has benefited from the development of internet te technology and from opportunities offered by the times. It is uh, from this standpoint that we wish to share our thoughts and experience in the field of data governance. Data is a key factor of the digital economy. Alibaba, a scientific enterprise starting with e-commerce, has empowered the digitalization of numerous merchants and products to meet the huge market demand in China. Since its establishment, Alibaba has played an integral part in establishing connections between merchants and the pro consumers throughout data. These data have made commercial operations smarter, information more transparent, and the adjustment of supply and the demand structure more efficient. It is also through data that we have built a trust system in transactions. Today, Alibaba serves nearly 10 million merchants and, uh, and 1.3 billion consumers worldwide. And we work to continuously create greater value for customers and the society. In 2009, the first line of code was written for Alibaba Cloud's self-developed cloud operation system. After 14 years of tireless efforts, our data-centric cloud computing platform has grown into a front runner worldwide. In the era of cloud computing, both individuals and uh, startups can enjoy the benefits of the digital economy. Mihayo is a video game development and uh, publishing company that took shape in a dormitory at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2011. Mihayo began to utilize Alibaba cloud computing service when there were only eight staffers in the company. As of June 2023, the net profit of this young company reached nearly 2.27 billion US dollars. It is fair to say that Mihayu is a true cloud-native digital enterprise. Its success is a microcosm of this era in which numerous innovative enterprises and the Alibaba cloud are mutually reinforcing. The value of data is unlimited, not only for business, but also for public services. During the Asian Games in Hangzhou, they just closed earlier this week. For example, cloud computing supported three core systems. The games management systems, results distribution systems, and game support systems. Alibaba Cloud also enabled the seamless integration of these core systems and provided the intelligent applications, such as broadcasting and event communications. With the technical support of Alibaba Cloud, we can see that the event became the first Asian game on the cloud. Only through law-based data governments can we give full play to the value of data. As an ancient Chinese saying has it, nothing can be accomplished without norms or standards. With the rapid development of the digital economy, data has played a vital role in promoting economic and social development. However, it has also posed the challenges to the protection of personal information, intellectual property rights, and network and data security. In the cyberspace, therefore, Promoting law-based data governments has become a global consensus. We believe that effective data governments will better facilitate data flow. Likewise, the free and secure flow of data within the framework of rule of law 
will give full play to the strength of data as a factor of production. On the one hand, as a unique factor of production, data can be utilized repeatedly by different parties thanks to their inclusiveness. On the other hand, data can generate different value in different scenarios as their generation and utilization involve various stakeholders, thus creating a bucket effect. For this reason, Alibaba Cloud has advocated the whole process management of data throughout their life cycle. Looking ahead, we, look, we would like to continue to participate in efforts to advance the rule of law in regard to data governments together with all clients and partners in this digital ecosystem. We face both opportunities and challenges in the area of AI. AI is one of the most innovative cutting-edge digital technologies in the world. As a high-tech internet enterprise, Alibaba Cloud launched R&D on our large language model in 2019. And the latest iteration, Tong Yi Qian Wen, was made available to the public recently. In the future, we will launch different partnership programs and endeavor to create more enterprise-specific models to ensure that every industry can better share the fruits of intelligent development. In the new era of intelligent development, we are the beneficiaries of the advance in AI while facing many uncertain risks and uh, confusion. In response, the, cyber, uh, the Cyberspace Administration of China, together with six other authorities, jointly issued in July the entry measures for administration of generative artificial intelligence service, the first of its kind globally. It provides a definitive legal environment and basis for the sound development of AI in China. In line with this regulation, Alibaba then released the management system for Syntec ethical risk review, introducing three principles of responsible AI, namely availability, reliability, and credibility. We hold that AI technology should serve the interests of humanity be advanced and stable, and protect personal privacy and data security. Here, we would like to make three proposals. First, establishing high-quality university public corporal. Second, developing the standard system and the precaution system of data security for opposing racial discrimination, safeguarding the rights and the interests of women and children. And third, actively carrying out international exchanges and cooperation in the field of data governments to promote global norms and consensus in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Thanks again for all speakers of the first session. Next is the second session of Round the Table. The moderator is my colleague, Wu Shengkuo. Thank you very much, Professor Liang. Now, let's move on to the second session of the round table discussion. Please remind you that uh, each speaker can have seven minutes. Firstly, let's welcome Mr. Fang Yu, Director of the Internet Law Research Center of China Academy of Information and Communications Technology. Please. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Uh, Distinguished guests, friends, good morning. Uh, firstly, please allow me to say hello by Japanese. Ohayou gozaimasu. Watashi wa fangyu desu. Koyoto wa 
初めてなんです。どうぞよろしく。Uh, this is the first time for me to be here in Kyoto.、Uh, this is a nice city and beautiful place.、Uh, more importantly, it is my great honor to speak at this forum. I am Fang Yu from China Academy of Information and Communications Technology, which refers to CASAT. The CSAT is a think tank in China engaged in research related to the field of network. Now I'm in charge of the Internet Law Research Center. My center mainly studies issues related, related to network legislation and has participated in several important legislation in China. As a think tank, We carry out some basic research, especially on cutting edge legal issues. As we all know, the growing digitalization of our world is one of the key trends of the 21st century, and it is fundamentally changing the way we live and work. Digital economy is developing rapidly. The Internet is now an indispensable global public good. We need new laws and regulations to govern the cyberspace. Mr. Tang Lei has given an overview of China's cyber law system, which is very impressive. Meanwhile, digital economy is driven by data. So I think data law is absolutely an important part in this system. The issue of data legislation is widely concerned by all countries in the world. In China, we generally divide it into three aspects data security, personal information protection, and data value. First, data security means to use legal measures to ensure the effective use of data without affecting national security. And social stability. To reach this goal, we need to make data classification and protect different types of data by different means. It covers many factors, but in which the issue of cross border data flows is very critical. Mr. Xu Zhiyuan has already explained this topic in great detail. So, I will not repeat it. Second, personal information protection can be said to be the fundamental rules in the developing of the digital economy. And most countries are faced with the contradiction between personal information protection and personal information utilization. The European Union wants to balance them by the famous GDPR. And many countries have developed their own personal information protection laws with reference to the EU approach. China has a long history of personal information protection pra practices and in 2021 adopted China's personal information protection law, which provides a Chinese plan for the protection and usage. Of personal information. The last is the issue of data value. This is quite essential for the digital economy, but there is not, is there no proper solution to this problem. And China is actively studying and exploring it. China has taken the lead in recognizing that data plays a fundamental role. In the development of the digital economy and encourages it to give full play to its essential role. However, many people are still deeply discussing the issue of data rights, hoping to determine the ownership of data through a legal framework to further realize the value of data. Distinguished guests, friends, I believe 
that data governance will be an issue which needs to be studied for a long time in the background of digital economy. I hope that countries around the world can work together to make progress, especially through discussions under the framework of the United Nations and other international mechanisms, so as to jointly improve the level of data governance and share the benefits of the digital economy development. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Fang, for your wonderful point of view. Now I give the floor to Hosaka Lee Makiyama, Director of European Center for International Political Economy, please. And uh, once again, I would like to repeat my uh, deepest gratitude to IGF, Beijing Normal University and CSE for this invitation to make this very brief intervention. And as a simple legal and economic scholar that has studied uh, global governance of data economy for the last 15 years, I'm very honored to offer my observation on this very difficult topic on the rule of law, because despite all the self-evident societal and developmental benefits that we have heard today uh, in this panel, um, as well as in the other forums of IGF, uh, it is well understood that the cross-border data flows has raised many important questions regarding rule of law, and especially in the context of international law. And when the internet and the data economy emerged two decades ago, the primary question used to be, and it's to some degree it still is, whether we can avoid internet becoming a legal void, uh, jurisdictional terra nullius, if you like, and to date, uh, I think the, uh, these concern has been pretty much addressed and the, the issue has been less about determination of jurisdiction or legal forum as it was believed, uh, as very often uh, the, um, the legal questions around new innovation tend to be very, very different than we imagined them uh, at the onset. And um, many jurisdictions have actually expanded uh, their reach and the legal basis with some form of extraterritoriality. Many speakers already uh, commended EU GDPR as uh, a model or a template for many laws that have followed. And uh, I think EU GDPR is also a good example of the extraterritoriality since it is applied extraterritorially based on the citizenship or residency of the data subject uh, rather than the object, which is the case in many other laws. And it has also established a practice of jurisdiction based on uh, the, the citizenship or the, the passport. Uh, or the, um, the the fiscal placement of the data subject, which has and the ecosystem turned out to be much more insulated, perhaps than what it was believed. Uh, we have seen that due to cultural and linguistical reasons, internet has actually much more local flavor than we expect them to have. And uh, due to the delivery of the data economy, which is so contingent on a physical continuum. So for example, like local uh, payment systems, uh, banking and uh, or a physical delivery of uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the transaction, we can also see that there is a natural um, tendency um, where these uh, jurisdictional questions have, have been resolved. And despite the use of the extraterritoriality issue associated with cross-border compliance and enforcement have been actually quite moderate. And to some extent, it is thanks to the legislative harmonization we have seen, for example, under the uh, COE Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, it is notable how basic liability principles or contract law or criminal law have actually applied equally online as well as offline in Europe and many other jurisdictions. And uh, increasingly, online services are also subject to various type of licensing and notification requirements, meaning that actually uh, the jurisdictional question has been resolved and also the rule of law has been uh, territorialized at onset. And um, 
if that is the development we have seen in the past two first two decades of the digital economy um where we have seen the evolution of legal doctrine uh which is based on personal information and data management that we know today we can also see that the current evolution uh in terms of rule of law on the internet uh is quite progressive where we have seen codification of in many instances of previous soft laws and executive decision and the codification has also led to more legal clarity uh as more and more rules are actually transparent and actually written down uh rather than executed as executive orders or soft law we see that um there is an improvement of rule of law however not all foreign economic actors may not necessarily share the desirability of this clarity or these outcomes that the rules have enabled so for example if i just would take an example from europe once again uh europe has introduced the digital services act digital markets act and data act or eu cloud services scheme which all have shifted the investigative ex post legislation like for example an anti trust enforcement to an ex ante approach through universal obligations and uh, through regulations rather than investigations and uh, and in other elsewhere we see uh, cyber security laws that have provided more legal clarity with clearer legal basis distinguishing different cases and practices uh, and once again uh, better cl um, clarity is always desirable and um, but some may simply just disagree with the rules and we still see issues with national treatment so critics say that the eu law set very arbitrary thresholds uh, of what high risk Uh, practices in tail and therefore it is very selective in its legal scope and in fact many thresholds are naturally ambiguous or subjective i think there was a disruption in my connection but i'll try again uh as we're saying um many thresholds that are naturally ambiguous or subjective and that's basically the nature of uh the internet law itself and uh, it is foreseen that case law uh will provide further clarity on these issues and uh, but given the dynamism of the legal systems uh on uh, of internet law as a subject uh the question is whether we will be required to change the legal framework and update them before any case law actually evolves this is the um this is the um the risks of um uh, governing fast paced technology uh, which we all have to live with and this basically leads to uh, a final point here that there is a universal problem where enforcement agencies have a natural disadvantage uh in understanding the current practices uh and um but not necessarily enforcing their rules transparency is of course synonymous with accountability and i think that the current trend shows that we are regulating to understand commercial practices use of patterns rather than mitigating actual potential risks associated with data flow or inadequate enforcement and i think that igf hosts uh, of this year japan has taken significant step here for the global community by taking the initiative for the institutional arrangement under the g7 on the fft and uh, which will enable governments to study issues and causality and best practices uh, for better data governance and to basically to wrap up uh, history and the future of cross border governance of data flows uh, has been characterized by friction of obligations uh, rather than a uh, perceived conflict of laws or values different legal system are founded on different societal values and despite these differences it is evident that the regulators seek surprisingly similar outcomes in their digital economy and try to address similar issues and however these outcomes may have very different commercial consequences if you look at individual companies a foreign disruptor in one country is actually an incumbent and a national champion in another country some objectives of policy create very different winners and losers 
this is not necessarily a product of diverging values or diverging objectives. And extraterritoriality can only be resolved through mutual cooperation and so, such as mutual legal assistance treaties. And many of the privacy laws have built in transfer mechanisms. MCC has been mentioned several times on the discourse of this panel, uh, but also adequacy decision. And these mechanisms uh, for expedited data sharing process can enhance efficiency and collaboration amongst agencies. However, enforcement can only be guaranteed by governments, not by private actors. And this is an understanding which is the basis of the European model and many other legal models we see across Asia. So impetus comes from harmonization, alignment of laws, and especially on data protection, privacy, and security, rather than establishing a common international standard or voluntary or trusted global frameworks. And I think uh, we see that the equivalence decisions and uh, other fundamental mechanisms for cross-border data flows are, are actually 100% legal in their nature. Trust is a matter of question between governments and people, but it does not necessarily relate to the data. It's a function of equivalence rather than between two jurisdiction, rather than a function of trust. And here's where many open data advocates tend to talk, prefer to talk about trust rather than equivalence between laws. So it may be a, a fictionary conflict that we see uh, around trust, where we see, as once again, that many agencies around the world are actually working towards similar goals, despite having very different societal backgrounds. Thank you so much, and uh, I'll pass the um, the word back to the panel. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lee Makiyama from Brussels for the interesting sharing. Next, we have Ms. Wang Rong, senior expert from Tencent Research Institute. Please. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wang Rong from Tencent Research Institute, which is a research platform uh, focusing on public policies in digital economy. I'm very honored to participate in the RGF Data Governance Forum. I guess that everyone must be impressed by the extraordinary accomplishments that China has achieved, just as Tang Lei, Depu Deputy Director, introduced uh, to us. Now, I would like to share the China's personal information protection from the perspective of corporate compliance practices. First, uh, I would like to share some interesting findings. So for the purpose of corporate compliance, Tencent Research Institute compared the pr provisions of China's personal information protection law, referred as PIPL, promoted in 2021 with the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation. As you know, that's GDPR. Through comparing these two laws, we found some interesting findings. The first, China's PIPL is fully integrated with the international general principles of personal information protection represented by GDPR. In terms of legislative model, China's PIPL adopted a globally mainstream model, which is very comprehensive and universal legislative model that is applicable to all sectors, not only to private sector, but also in public sector. And third, in terms of the law's content, the specific rules, the PIPL introduces the basic rules including the legal basis of data processing, the rights of data subjects, the obligations of data controllers and data processors. Finally, in terms of strictness of rules, China's PLPL is basically matches the EU GDPR standard. In some aspects, China's PIPL is even more stringent than GDPR. So as we conclude, 
although there are still some subtle difference between the PRPL and the GDPR, but in generally speaking, the China's PRPL is highly compatible with the international legislation standard. The strict PRPL in line with international standards will, be, will bring full benefits to the healthy development of platform companies such as Tencent. Companies will fully embrace the implementation of law with a positive attitude. It is constructive to help the digital industry to build consumer trust through legal system protection. As you know, rebuilding consumers' confidence and security trust is one of the core issues in the digital society. We believe the legal system itself undoubtedly plays an important role in now. As data processing scenarios become more complex, data flows between different institutions increase dramatically. Through the legal system, clarifying the legal responsibilities of different market players in different aspects of data processing is very constructive to, accept, to establish data protection ecosystem. So based on our business, Tencent relies on systematic tools to implement data pro uh, privacy compliance work. Tencent is one of the earliest internet companies in China to explore personal information protection and data compliance. We emphasize technology itself to empower privacy protection. We have developed uh, the Lingxi privacy platform to establish comprehensive technical capabilities to facilitate our service to fully comply with the privacy protection requirements. In addition, Tencent continue, uh, continues to develop privacy, uh, privacy technologies such as federated learning, trusted computing, and a secure multi-party computing to explore more technical solutions for personal information protection in the whole life cycle of digital service. In the practice of implementation of the PIPL, Tencent continues to improve pro products transparency, giving our users more choice and control and provide one-stop privacy solutions for our users. Besides that, we have established an integrated rights response and processing mechanism to ensure that users' personal information rights requests are responded in a timely and effective way. So, in a conclusion, just as we advocated of technology for good, we hope that our products and services themselves try to take advantage of technology to do good and build up the consumer's trust. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Wang, for your relevant sharing. Now, let's welcome Mr. Zhu Ran, Vice President of Alibaba Cloud Intelligence Group, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, good morning, everyone. It's my honor to participate in the workshop in on role of law for data governance of 18th Internet Governance Forum and uh, share my ideas on this topic with all of you. The Chinese government has always adhered to the principle of governing the Internet in accordance with law in its efforts to promote the healthy and orderly development of the Internet. The rule of law on the Internet is not only an, an important way of digital governance, but also an important outcome of digital civilization advancement. Alibaba has done a lot of work in data governance in line with national laws and the regulations as well as international initiatives. Practice of Alibaba Cloud in data governance. Alibaba Cloud Intelligent Groups 
has been committed to the cloud-based data governance for years, relying on self-developed AppSara system, which prives clients from more than 200 countries and regions worldwide with cloud services such as computing, storage, networking, data processing, and security protection. The group has explored a complete set of methods for data governance. In terms of compliance governance, as a company that provides cloud computing services for the public, Alibaba Cloud has worked to improve data compliance government governance and has become a cloud service provider with the best qualification in Asia as well as an industry leader in protecting data security and privacy of cloud computing. As early as 2013, Alibaba Cloud passed ISO 27,000 and uh, CSA star certification and uh, later passed PCI DSS certification in the financial field. In terms of technical guarantees, Alibaba Cloud continues to strengthen technical guarantees for data governance of the cloud platform. First, Alibaba Cloud has classified various types of data on the cloud and ensured data security in their usage, entry and exit, and other situations by taking advantage of technologies and stepping up operation and maintenance system. Second, Alibaba Cloud has established well-functioning disaster recovery system and uh, redundant systems for cloud computing, networking, storage of data. Several disaster recovery systems has been built such as dual active in the same city, backup data in other cities in case of disaster, multi-active in multiple cities, scheme of two places and uh, three centers, and so on. Third, in terms of infrastructure, Alibaba Cloud has established security controls over data with regard to its storage, encryption, transmission encryption, and uh, across control, ensuring data security of multi tenancy in cloud computing. As for the policy support, Alibaba Cloud took the lead in launching a data security initiative in 2015, stating that since data are customers' assets, cloud computing platforms cannot be used for other purposes. Rather, platforms have the obligation to help protect the privacy, integrity, and uh, availability of client data. The initiative also held that cloud computing platforms should provide a privacy and data protection framework and a scheme for cloud users. In 2021, Alibaba Cloud released the Data Security and Privacy Protection White Paper, which introduces the best practice of Alibaba applying cloud computing to safeguarding data security. Efforts in security protection involve physical security, data storage, network transmission, computing security, as well as backup and disaster recovery.
dental governance for the large language model, LLM. Recently, Alibaba Cloud officially launched our LLM, Tongyi Qianwen. This is a next generation model for enterprise users. It can understand complex instructions, engage in multi-round dialogue, write copy, perform logic reasoning, understand multimodal inputs, and support multiple languages. So it can be applied in, for example, planning, office administration, shopping, recommendation, and home design to help customers raise efficiency of their work and services. What's more, enterprises can build their own LLM models by Tongyi Qianwen to develop more enterprise-level applications. We believe that data guidance for LLM determines the scope and the depth of LLM's application. Therefore, R&D and application of AI have always been pursued under the guidance of principles of availability, reliability, credibility, and uh, controllability in Alibaba Cloud. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhu, for your profound insights. Now, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Zhao Jingwu, Associate Professor of Law School of Beihang University. Please. Oh, thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my honor to have an opportunity to share my thoughts speech here. I'm Zhao Jingwu from Beihang University. Uh, what I would like to talk today is uh, a simple uh, issues is how to ensuring the security of corresponding data flow through the legal instruments. Well, in modern society, the economic and strategy value of data has become crucial element of national innovative development of digital economy. Well, the combination of traditional and digital business has changed the operating model of the real economy, as well the basic condition of international digital economy de development. So cross-border data flow is not just a matter of domestic data security regulation and the commercial utilization, but also a complex issue that affect the promoting of global digital economy. Well, in recent years, we can see that more and more countries, regions, and international organizations, including China, has tried to explore safe and trustworthy model for cross-border data flow through domestic legislation, bilateral agreements, and uh, international treaties. Well, however, at the same time, there are also many controversy needs to be solved urgently. Well, in this context, we can see that China has uh, actively promoting the governance path, the governance path of cross-border data flow. However, here is a misleading in the international governance activities, which is to encourage the cross-border data flow without restrictions. Well, perhaps their original intention was to achieve a border and a more efficiency data flow effects. But the key is they fail to understand the relationship between the data security and data flow. Well, it's worth mentioning that in the Article 1 of the data security law in China, the government's idea of data is to ensure data security and promote data development and utilization. Well, in summary, it means pay equal attention to safety and utilization. So we agree that blindly pursue cross-border data flow without paying attention to data security is not only fail to re realize the exchange value of data, but also breeds security risk such as data linkage and theft, which would lead in the reduction of the economy value of data resources. So in the international community, there is a view of China follow the data controlism path, which is essentially politicalize the issue of data security. That is because we don't have a unified standard for the international cross-border data flow around the world. 
while multilational cooperation always have to comply with different domestic laws and the international agreement. So there's no denying that the national data security and the citizen personal privacy are generally recognized primers for cross-burning data flow. Furthermore, across the global, there's no country allowed cross-border cross data flow without any condition. And the more country, the domestic law put data security and the national security as the first place. So what I want to emphasize is China insist on an open and cooperative governance model for cross-border data flow. It's not an empty word. China's domestic law has clearly defined four categories of rules for cross-border data flow, which including security assignment of outboarding data transfer, standard contract for the cross-border transfer of personal information, a third-party security certification, and special rules for special areas. So all above these rules are supported by the corresponding laws and regulations. So moreover, a few days ago, Chinese regulator authorities, authorities just released the regulation on regulating and facilitating the cross-border data flow, where it's a draft for comments, which further refined China's governance framework for cross-border data flow and the response practical issues with social general concern. For example, the draft clarified that the outbounding data transfer does not require security assignment, standard contract, or security certification when the non-important data generated in the activities, such as international trades, academic corporations, corresponding manufacturing, and the market influence activities. So Chinese supervisation system for corresponding data flow is not simply to re restrict data export, but to better protect and promoting data export. So Chinese legislation has established diverse channel for cross-border data flows, which not only catering to the market demands for various industrial and enterprise, but also align with international rules on the cross-border data flows. So all of these help multinational enterprise to solve practical problems for repeating the compliance, multiple compliance, and even conflict compliance during the processing of outbounding data transfer. Finally, I hope we can reach a consensus that the governance of data, which especially the cross border data flow, cannot ignore data security, nor can it set too many restrictions for security. The concept of security and the utilization coexistence in China data governance system, offering China a wisdom and approaching to solve the problem of cross-border data flow. That is all what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wu. Thank you, Professor Zhao, for your wonderful words. Due to time limitation, we have to conclude this forum. We hope to have more in-depth exchanges and discussions in the future. Once again, we would like to thank all guests and friends for your wisdom and efforts to contribute to this open forum. We also would like to thank UNIGF for providing us with a more than relevant dialogue platform. This open forum is concluded here. We invite all of you to have a photo group here. Thank you.